hello viewers this class we are going to discuss the flower the feature of angiosperms reproductive feature of angiosperms flower is an uh, evolutionary marvel in the sense each part of the flower is having a specific function this can be linked to evolution as we will be discussing in subsequent parts so a flower is a condensed stem with a definite growth it grows for specific length where the different appendages are sepals petals stamens and carpels as it is seen the internode is almost reduced and the appendages appear to arise from a very common point so that's why it is said the flower is a condensed shoot meant for reproduction the stalk of the flower is called pedicel on which at the tip of which all the floral appendages are born usually the tip of the pedicel is swollen and called receptacle to which all the appendages are attached it is seen all plants have typically in their flowers have four whorls calyx corolla androecium and gynoecium androecium sorry calyx consists of sepals corolla consists of petals androecium consists of stamens and gynoecium consists of carpel or many carpels so those flowers having all these four whorls are said to be complete aaj we have seen in our practical classes hibiscus the typical flower dicotyledonous flower you see it has a typical stalk called pedicel and at the tip of which the all the appendages are born but the receptacle is not uh, seen here so the first whorl is calyx then corolla then androecium then gynoecium as it consists of all four whorls it is called complete and further the two essential whorls of any flower is your androecium and gynoecium as they do take part in reproduction so any flower having the essential whorls androecium and gynoecium is called perfect so this flower having all four whorls is called complete and so also it is a perfect flower and it is a perfect pentamerous flower typical of all the dicots this one it is lilium this is a lily and you can see this is a trimerous flower hopefully it is well visible it is having a good receptacle fleshy receptacle and i have removed some of the tepals from this so that you can see the point from which all the tepals arise so now instead of two whorls calyx and corolla this has one whorl that is called perianth wherever sepals and petals are indistinguishable the whorl surrounding the stamens and carpels is called perianth and the individual members of the perianth are called tepals so now it is also a perfect flower having stamens and carpels incomplete flower we are acquainted with this plant cucurbita cucurbita has both monocot and dicot flowers sorry male and female flowers born in the same plant so male flowers are there female flowers are there. male flower has three whorls calyx corolla androecium female has calyx corolla and gynoecium so both are incomplete flowers both are incomplete flowers and further i want to uh, exemplify that or explain that this condition is called monoecious condition as in the same house in the same plant both male and female flowers are born and further this as seen from this they have five sepals as well as five petals so these flowers are also pentamerous in nature next this one the red flower is clearly a tetramerous flower this belongs to ixora 
काठ रंगणी दिस इज परफेक्ट टेट्रामरस फ्लावर सिमेट्रिकल फ्लावर इन दिस यू कैन सी ऑल फोर पेटल्स एंड एंथर्स अटैच टू द पेटल्स सो एफ ई पटेल कंडीशन यू कैन फाइंड एंड इन द रईट सैड यू कैन सी दिस इज द फ्लावर अफ राफाना साटाइवस मूला रैडिश very few might have seen the flower of this but this is a cross shaped flower so raphana sativus a tetramerous flower this uh, raphana sativus belongs to cruciform as the four petals are arranged in a cross shaped manner cruciform manner jesus christ cru, uh, cruciform manner so that's why this belongs to family cruciferi what i mean to say both pentamerous flowers and these tetramerous flowers are uh, found in dicots and trimerous flower is found in uh, monocots now i want to discuss uh, the different whorls what the first whorl is calyx calyx consists of sepals and the sepals form the lowermost whorl or lowermost they are born at the lowest level so this flower i think you are acquainted with this this is datura in odia it is dudura these are the leaves but this is a flower bud are you able to see any of other appendages no what is seen this one only the sepal it is a gamosepalous condition the sepals are fused forming a tube like structure but accepting the sepals nothing inside are seen so sepals are the outermost they are present in the lowermost region of all the appendages and they constitute the calyx but their function is protection they protect rest of the whorls from uh, drying and they provide an internal environment where the humidity is high so other floral organs uh, develop inside uh, this cup shaped structure of the calyx so now sepals are the thickest they are the green structure of the flower and they are the toughest and epidermis having cuticle is also present there that's why it is called it is waxiest of all the floral parts but you will find in rest of the uh whorls you won't find any waxy coating or any tough structure so these sepals are green toughest and they provide protection to rest of the whorl and usually green but in some of the flowers you will be find sepals are often uh, petal like so that's why sepals are called petaloid sepals you might have seen this is the leafy nature this is cucurbita the sepals are fully leaf like you will be confusing whether they are sepals or they are leaf these are sepals but fully leaf like and the petals even is green they in due course of time they will turn yellowish and become the corolla okay and this is a uh, female flower and this one as i told you in certain flowers the sep um, uh, sepals become petal like they are petaloid sepals the main reason is attraction at to attract the pollinators so this is salvia this belongs to the family lamiaceae tulasi family ro gachhote ethire petal sepals uda madhyam petal bhali hai chi dur ru sepal petal ko uta jani hobo nahi kintu they are if you see from the close vicinity you can see which are the sepals and which are the petals so gamosepalous and gamopetalous condition is found in this and you can see a honeybee is collecting pollen from that but by that unknowing, unknowingly it is doing the job of pollination on the receptacle petals are just above the sepals which together constitute the corolla in flower we will be discussing more about this petals because petals are variously colored the color of the petals is other than green they may be red they may be bluish 
they may, may be of different colors. So, the color of the petals is because of either carotenoids or anthocyanins of different color and we will see morning glory, oparajita, petunia, they have anthocyanin in them and anthocyanin is housed that pigment is a water soluble pigment present in the vacuoles of the petals. Now, so next is your you can see you can do a very good experiment at home whether the petals contain carotenoids or anthocyanin. I have taken hot water in a glass glass and I put the flowers therein and the other one is cold one. When in the hot water it is put for 2 to 3 minutes then definitely the pigment comes out it is leaching out as it is water soluble housed in the vacuole when we put it in hot water uh, the tonoplast that is vacuolar membrane plasma membrane, membrane they are disrupted and the pigments they come out. Whereas, in the other one when it is put in cold water normal temperature at 25 degree centigrade or so it does not as the cells remain intact, but if you put this marigold gendufula in the same way you would not get in hot water the pigment will not come out. So, it signifies if it is not coming out in hot water it is not anthocyanin rather it is your carotenoids. So, now above the petals are important in attracting pollinators petals have different sizes shapes and color and arrangement. So, now generally if you look at the nature some flowers bloom in night, night blooming flowers are usually white in color, they are white they lack any pigment as it is found in Tagoro, Taborno Montana and in some other plants, but other you see this one I have written this is a day blooming flower this name is morning glory the name itself signifies it blooms in the morning and this is a color plant. So, color of the flower is enough to be visible to the insects and pollinators, but white flowers attract the pollinators by their fragrance, but these flowers attract mostly by their color. Now, if you look at this this is a uh, flower or inflorescence of Asteris familiari family. Now, you can see one yellow patch and this pattern, this pattern is used by or the flower use this pattern for attract a specific kind of pollinators. You can see a piece dorsata is pollinating or collecting pollens, collecting pollens from this flower. Next this one, very interesting one, this is Mirtania and in Odia it is called Baghanokhi and this is the flower, it is bilaterally symmetrically flower and a specific kind of uh, spot is present at the mouth of the uh, gamma petalus corolla and that is called honey guide. That honey guide is used or plants use this for attracting certain kinds of insects and further everybody wants to advertise himself. Day blooming flowers with huge big flowers and bright color they attract pollinators, but those who are wind pollinating those who are which are pollinated by wind these plants never invest in formation of petals. Here you can see rice, rice does not produce sepals and petals rather highly reduced perianth called lodicule is formed therein. So, like rice other wind pollinating plants do not invest energy and biomass in producing the perianth corolla. Other flowers day blooming flowers attract pollinators, but wind pollinated flowers has nothing to attract because wind blows. So, that is why these plants have evolved highly reduced perianth. So, the perianth is represented by lodocle here and other adaptations of these wind pollinator flowers as you can see they have feathery stigma and 
the anthers, beautiful anthers, six in number in each flower, right? They are highly swinging in the air and they shed their pollens so that they can be collected by these uh, feathery stigmas. So, now next two essential walls are the stamens and carpels and the stamens collectively called as androsium. The number of stamens vary from flower to flower. As we have seen in our hibiscus, we write the number of stamens is infinity, large number of stamens are there. So, the stamens are usually called microsporophylls as they produce microspores in their spore producing structure called anther. Generally, a stamen is referred to as microsporophyll and it is the male part of the flower. Truly speaking, the anther is not the male plat part, rather it on meiosis produces microspores which on a further development give rise to the male gametes. As male gametes produced in the anthers that to stamens, stamens that is why are called microsporophylls and all stamens constitute androsium. Andros means male. Okay. So, each stamen consists of a filament, a stalk and the real spore producing structure called anther. As revealed, a typical anther consists of two halves first, two equal halves and then each half again further has two lobes. So, in total a typical uh, dicotanther or monocotanther has four longitudinal lobes or four longitudinal structures called sporangia. That is why a typical anther is said to be dithecus or and tetrasporangia type. As we see this, this plant is a monocot plant and it is amaryllis. I think you can see there are six stamens. Each stamen consists of four longitudinal structures, three are seen from this side and one is the other side, it is not visible. So, usually four longitudinal structures, four sporangia, they are arranged in this anther. What is this? Hopefully, all of you are acquainted with this is taken generally with a camera and these are the two essential structures of hibiscus, the stamens and the carpels, but entire carpel is not seen here rather the five stigmas are shown here, five stigma they are hair stigmas, beautiful condition to enjoy because the anthers have dehized, they have opened apart releasing the pollens. Now, these pollens are attached to the stigma. So, carpel the innermost whorl, gynosium the innermost whorl. It consists of, it may consist of one carpel or more than one. All legumes, all the beans, they have one carpel they are monocarpellary, but if you look at lady's finger, it consists of five, five carpels, but all the five carpels in hibiscus, in lady's finger, all the five carpels are fused together forming a compound structure called pistil. So, the flower which is having only pistil or carpel, that means female flowers are called pistillate flowers what we say in cucurbita, we can find female flower called pistillate flower or else it has male flower called staminate flowers. Okay. Those having both stamens and carpels as essential structures, they are called as bisexual flowers. Now, each carpel or a pistil has three parts, the uppermost part is the stigma, which is projected beyond the flower and it is meant for or it is the site to which the pollens land on or stigma 
is the site to which pollens bind. So, it is pollen landing surface and the basal part of the uh, carpel is ovary, it is the swollen part. The basal part of the carpel is the ovary. Ovary is a bulbous structure and the structure that joins you can come to this point the structure that joins the ovary to the stigma is your style. So, style stigma style and ovary they have different functions assigned to them stigma is the landing ground of the pollens style elevates the stigma above the petals. So, that the pollinators can visit the stigma and the basal portion is the ovary. Ovary houses one or more ovules. We have seen mango. Mango the ovary has only one ovule in it, but if you look at a bean, if you look at a pea, Pisum sativum, it has so many ovules in it. So, the number of ovules in each ovary may vary depending on the plant type or species type. So, now the function of the carpel is to house ovules inside the ovary and the ovary consists of as we have seen a ovary contains ovules generally in angiosperms the ovule is uh, anatropous type. The anatropous ovule is like this, it has a funiculus, the stalk of the ovule is called funiculus and it has the two integuments outer coatings and this the central mass of cells is your new cellus. This is the new cellus and these are this is outer integument. outer integument and this is inner integument and the central mass of cells is the new cellus and the integuments the coverings they encircle the new cellus from one side leaving a small aperture at the top and this is your micropyle this is your micropyle small opening and the other end is called chalazal. So, this end is called micropylar end and this one is called chalazal end, chalazal end. Now, 70 percent of the angiosperms have this kind of ovule and this ovule is your anatropous ovule, where the ovule is curved in such a way that the micropyle is near to the funiculus. So, now this ovule is the structure of the sporophyte, it is deep seated in the ovarian cavity. This is the site where you can see here one of the cells become large and visible okay. and this is a 2 n cell all the cells are twin, but one of the cells of the nucleus becomes megaspore mother cell, it grows. Its fate is to go for meiosis or this is MMC megaspore mother cell. Now, this megaspore mother cell will further go for meiotic division resulting in 4 megaspores. Main difference between microspores and megaspores is Microspores are produced in a large number because microspores lead to pollen grain formation and pollens travel from flower to flower, but megaspore is sedentary, it remains attached to the parent plant, they are not lost, but pollens are lost in the transit. So, to cope with, to bear with the loss, the damage of the pollens, so plants produced large number of microspores and so also subsequently they are turned to pollens.
Now, we are going to discuss how the male and female gametes are formed, because male and female gametes are necessary for fertilization to take place. So, male gametes are produced in the male gametophyte, whereas the female gamete is produced in the female gametophyte, where they are present. As we recall, the male gametophyte is a pollen grain and the female gametophyte is an embryo sac or the female gametophyte, it is present inside the ovule. So, for development of male gamete from male gametophyte, we have to discuss the anther and its anatomy and the meiosis and other aspects, so that development of male gametophyte can take place. Now, a stamen is a microsporophyll, the filament is just the subtending part, it provides nutrition uh, to the anther, but the anther is itself the spore producing structure. We discussed anther is tetrasporangia type and the uh, inside the anther, the, the wall we will see it consists of four layers and inside the anther or inner to the anther wall in the center there is a tubular structure called microsporangium or the pollen sac. So, in the pollen sac we will find initially the archisporial initials, these initials grow and they are destined to um, form microsporocyte. The discussion can be held in two points, one is microsporogenesis. Microsporogenesis is the process in which a microsporocyte present in the pollen sac or microsporangium, which is a diploid cell, it undergoes meiosis producing four microspores. These microspores, they are formed in a group of four called spore tetrad and they are glued together and they become free from each other subsequently. And this haploid microspore further grows in size, divide mitotically resulting in a three cell structure to form a pollen grain that may be a two celled initially and subsequently three cell structure. So, a matured pollen grain is a three cell structure. So, in that matured pollen grain we will be having two sperms male gametes. So, that is why the pollen grain is the male gametophyte and formation of microspore from microsporocyte or microspore mother cell by way of meiosis is microsporogenesis. Once microspore is formed, then it grows in size, then mitotic division takes place we will be discussing resulting in a three cell structure and out of which two are the sperm cells or sperm male gametes. So, that is why this part starting from microspore to pollen grain formation is microgametogenesis. Now, let us have a look at the anther wall. The anther wall consists of four layers from outer side, the outer one is epidermis, brick shaped cells, flattened cells, right. It is a continuous structure. Inner to that is endothesium. Endothesium is a single layer cells, these are large cells, these are very large cells and the endothesium they are responsible ultimately for dehiscence and inner to endothesium epithesium is single layered, endothesium is a single layer of large cells and middle layers they are very small cells 2 to 3 layer cells inner to endothesium and the innermost layer of the wall is the tapetum that is highly significant. Okay. So, tapetum is a layer, the cells are very big and they serve as nursing cells. Their function is to nurse or nourish the developing pollen grains. So, now besides this, let us have a look. In the pollen sac, the diploid archisporial initial cells, 
they transform them by means of growth to meiocytes, the cells which undergo meiosis and these are called microspore mother cells. Okay. These microspore mother cells, each of them undergo meiosis resulting in four microspores. These four microspores which are haploid, they are uh, bound to each other in a condition called spore tetrad. Now, microspores are initially glued together as will be seen, but later they go on separating from each other because the four microspores they do not remain together rather they become free from each other. So, definitely what is imminent definitely the glue the cementing substance which hold all the four together they must be that glue must be dissolved. So, that is why they must be separated and that is the glue is callose a polymer and the callose is dissolved or digested by the enzyme callage further the callage enzyme is secreted by the tapetum. So, tapetum on secretion of callage which digest the uh, wall surrounding all four microspores and the uh, cementing substance be in between them. So, ultimately the microspores are unglued separate from each other and once the microspores are free from each other the term pollen grain is used. So, ultimately the immediate product of meiosis they are microspores once the microspores they are free and uh, um, have independence the term pollen grain is used. So, pollen grain young pollen grain and subsequently they mature to form matured pollen grain. Now, the function of your tapetum is very important by way they undergo death uh, the tapetal cells undergo a kind of death called program cell death as a result of which they secrete not only enzyme rather carotenoids, lipids and many a substances which are necessary for the development of the pollen grain. So, let us look at this, this is just a microsporangium. Now, the microsporangium has so many microspore tetras in the right you can see four microspores or young pollens they are released from a tetrad. So, this action is done by a enzyme called ca callage. So, now each microspore grows in its size and becomes a pollen grain. Important is the pollen develops or microspore as it grows in size by absorbing liquid substances from the pollen chamber or microsporangial chamber then they increase in size then they become vacuolated and ultimately by that time they develop two kinds of wall investment. So, the pollen develop wall around it the inner wall is intine and outer to that is your exine. Now, what is seen exactly the pollen grain as it grows in size it develops wall around it. So, the inner wall is intine and outer one is exine and there is a haploid nucleus here and this haploid nucleus again undergo asymmetric mitotic division asymmetric mitotic division. Subsequently, this divides resulting in two nuclei and one nucleus is here and this is your generative, generative cell and generative cell and the large one is the vegetative cell. So, this way initially the growth takes place and wall investment goes on around it. Now, this is a two celled pollen grain, this is a two celled pollen grain. Now, a very small cell attached to the cell wall 
that is the generative cell. As the name suggests, why we must understand why it is so called the generative cell on further mitosis it gives rise to it undergoes a mitosis and results in two sperm cells two sperm cells so that's why the name generative cell vegetative cell as the name suggests this is the pollen tube cell because this will give rise to pollen tube while it lands on the stigmatic surface now thing is this is a generative cell this cell becomes free from the cell wall and ultimately a cell which is suspended it is a spindle shaped cell it is suspended in the vegetative cell cytoplasm why this becomes spindle shaped it is assumed that if it is a spherical cell then it may face difficulty while passing through the pollen tube but if it becomes spindle shape then it is easy so that's why this generative cell now again undergoes another mitotic division to form two sperm cells ultimately here two sperms are produced here these sperms are haploid sperms and mostly filled with nuclei and little bit of cytoplasmic uh, cytoplasm with organelles usually the sperms do not have plastids in them right what about this uh, exine exine is the outer coating and exine is formed of a substance called sporopollenin exine is made of sporopollenin this is of very much significance it is a polymer or it is a compound formed of carotenoid derivatives so this is deposited two things we must remember the inner wall is intine the intine is formed of calloge a soft substance it is not hard substance so the calloge wall is deposited by the microspore protoplast itself whereas the outer investment the outer wall the exine is deposited by the tapetum along with sporopollenin other lipid rich substances lipid rich substances are also deposited around this forming pollen kits now question is sporopollenin is one of the toughest material in the uh, living world they are bio resistant they cannot be degraded by acid or alkali therefore pollen grains with sporopollenin in its coat are long lived they are not easily destroyed pollens are resistant as they are resistant to degradation they are well preserved in the fossil deposits in the coal deposits that's why the pollens are suitable for, for fossil study the branch of uh, plant biology that deals with pollens and link to biosystematics is your palynology and here you can see the outer coating exine is not deposited all around in certain regions the uh, sporopollenin is thinly deposited or absent so the area that that may be linear or circular the area where the sporopollenin is not deposited these are said to be germ pores the sites in future a germ tube pollen tube will emerge you can see the exine because of sporopollenin is variously sculptured it has the outer coating has ridges furrows lines and so many things you see this this is transfer section of anther of datura easily you can see the pollens in the first left diagram the pollens are already released only the anther wall is left but the pollens were there in there is no dehiscence but when we took the uh, transfer section then pollens are uh, released from that but naturally it has not dehiscent the anther has not dehiscent not burst so therefore four 
pollen chambers are now seen and the second one you can see the pollens these are the pollens of hibiscus rosa sinensis mandar in light microscope we have taken this and you can see the pollens have spine like structures in their exine they are yellow in color if you look this and other pollens they have different patterns in their exine therefore the pollen shape the exine pattern is species specific those who are specializing pollens palynologist easily they can tell of what plant this pollen is or what family this pollen is so pollens are a clue to identification of plants so now pollens are well preserved in fossil deposits as i told you pollens cause allergies this parthen parthenium which generally called carrot grass because the inflorescence of this looks like carrot uh, inflorescence so that's why it is called carrot grass sometimes it is also called congress grass because this these seeds came to india when in 1950s wheat was imported in congress regime for that reason probably it is called congress grass okay so this the pollens this is a weed parthenium is a weed this grows elsewhere in the uh, rail lines and elsewhere so their pollens cause allergies some people they sneeze often because of pollen because pollens are allergic to some people and further as pollens are very small structures they are released in large number from the plants and they are rich in lipids and other uh, valuable substances minerals in them therefore pollens are in form of tablets and syrups are used by athletes for energy purpose they take this the haploid nucleus of the microspore now i can say here how exactly this male gametophyte developed male gametophyte developed now this haploid nucleus of the microspore move to one side they are it divided but mitotic division nuclear division is symmetric but cytoplasmic division remained asymmetric around this there was very little cytoplasm then only it resulted in one generative cell and one vegetative cell the vegetative cell nucleus is somewhat convoluted it has more surface area and it controls the entire vegetative cell okay now the generative cell as the name suggest it will produce the it produces the sperm by meiosis sorry by mitosis it may be taken note prior to division of the generative cell to two sperm cells by means of mitosis they are once it undergoes dna replication so generative cell nucleus undergoes dna replication before the cell divides now finally two celled pollens and th three celled pollens we can get a two celled pollen can be released from certain plants 75% of the angiosperms they shed their pollens at two cell stage which is a immature pollen grain and this this two cell pollens when they land on their right kind of stigma they are or while sending the pollen tube they are the generative cell divides resulting in two sperm cells completing the process of formation of sperms so they are they the male gametophyte becomes three celled and in others while it is in the anther the pollen development becomes complete and it becomes three celled so it doesn't matter whether it two celled or three celled ultimately on landing two sperms are they are in the male gametophyte okay so you can see this is the sculpturing of pollen exine this is scanning electron micrograph of a pollen 
from Kaeta. This plant we do not know, but this is a uh, these are the pollens of this Kaeta plant and you can see the different patterns of a deposition of poly uh, exine in it, sporopollen in it and the germ pores are clearly visible. Now, the two sperm cells are not surrounded by heavy thick wall as sperms ultimately will as sperms ultimately will meet the egg for fertilization if a heavy wall would be invested around definitely they are not going to fuse. So, that is why sperm cells have thick very thin wall that is either callous type cell wall and the two sperms they are suspended in the cytoplasm of the vegetative cell. Now, once the pollens are ready the anther wall dehydes in a particular line resulting in release of pollens. So, you can see this in this uh, lilium the anthers are split longitudinally resulting in release of the pollens. So, this is the summary how the develop microsporogenesis and microgametogenesis results in two celled pollen grain then megasporogenesis. Megasporogenesis that is formation of megaspore already we have discussed ovary houses you see the structures carpel consists of stigma style ovary. Ovary is the bulbous structure it has wall and it has placenta in the center. So, to the placenta ovules are attached by means of funiculus and each ovule is surrounded by integuments and one opening is left at the apex that is your micropyle and in the center there is a megasporocyte that is megaspore mother cell you can see this. This is the transverse section of hibiscus ovary. You can see the at the center pentaradiate placenta is there and to each placenta placenta there is attachment of the ovules. Now, within the uh, new cells the megaspore mother cells mother cell one mother cell undergoes meiosis resulting in four linear structures that is called linear tetrad. But only one of these four megaspores will survive and rest three will degenerate. Out of four the mi three micropylar ends they undergo program cell death or they degenerate resulting in only one megaspore left at the chala jala end. So, this is about megasporogenesis only one megaspore survives which is a haploid structure further this megaspore increases at the cost of the dying cells at the cost of dying cells the nucleus divides thrice three successive divisions of mitotic divisions of this megaspore nucleus takes place resulting in four or eight nuclei eight nuclei four at each end. Let us have a discussion like this. This is the initial megaspore this is its nucleus. This nucleus divides by three successive divisions mitotic division resulting in first when two nuclei are formed here one nucleus here another nucleus likewise this again divide twice this again divide twice resulting in n n 4 4 nuclei at each pole and this cell is vacuolated. Now, redistribution of the nuclei take place 3 remain at this end 3 remain at this end and 2 from opposite poles they migrate to the center. Now, ultimately following this there is free cell formation. So, you can look at this when there is redistribution of the 8 nuclei 3 remains at the micropylar end 3 at the chala chala end and 2 in the center and then surrounding each nucleus there is cell wall formation along with little bit of cytoplasm. So, this results a 7 cell structure those remaining at the micropylar end constitute the egg apparatus 
the central one is the egg cell and the two side cells are the synergids and in the center the cell is primary endosperm cell that has two haploid nuclei and those at the chalazal end constitute the antipodals and they this seven cell structure is the female gametophyte that does not leave uh, the plant that remains in the ovule itself. So, now as this type of uh, female gametophyte develops from a single spore that is monosporic embryo sac and it was discovered in polygonum. So, that is why the monosporic embryo sac is polygonum type typical of the angiosperms. Difference of male and female gametophyte is male gametophyte is three cell structure independent of the sporophyte as it leaves the plant and it tolerates desiccation chemicals because it leaves the parent plant whereas the female gametophyte is a seven cell structure dependent on the female gametophyte it remains attached to the female gametophyte and susceptible to desiccation. Now, this retention of the female gametophyte in the embryo sorry in the ovule is necessary for seed formation. Thank you.